What do you think? I think we're dead meat. Real dead meat. You're dead meat! Go ahead and laugh, you guys. The final final little pass is a business. A dead meat. Hey everybody, welcome to What's Your Favorite Scary Movie, where I talk to people about their favorite horror movies. Today's guest is Rhett McLaughlin of Internet's Rhett and Link. Hey Rhett. Hey, hey, what's up James? How you doing, man? I'm doing all right, considering everything. I hope you are too, man. Yeah, as you can see, I have uh, fully embraced the quarantine look. <laughs> yeah. I wasn't cutting my hair or my beard before any of this happened for like months, but now I just look like somebody who's been in quarantine for months on my own. Is that something you're kind of leaning into? Well, I've always been, I, and people know this about me, I am a little bit obsessed with the apocalypse. Like I'm one of those guys that's sort of like a prepper light. We got plenty of stuff at our house. I mean, we took masks to the hospital just to give you an idea of the <laughs> oh, stuff wow. that we that we had in our house because I already had N95 masks. I don't know why. I'm just- Like ahead of time before oh, coronavirus yeah. was even a thing? Wow. <laughs> yeah, I did. <laughs> I had them. Now that I'm in the midst of an apocalyptic event, I'm kind of ready for things to get back to normal. <laughs> yeah. But hey, at least you're prepared for it, man. Yeah, right. Thank you so much for joining me on this quarantine-friendly show where I can just talk to people remotely uh, about their favorite horror movie. And your favorite horror movie, you told me, was The Cabin in the Woods. Yes. You know, it's interesting because we, we talked a little bit about this before, and I originally thought that I would end up talking about Texas Chainsaw Massacre, right? Because when somebody asks you what your favorite thing is, a lot of times I end up just kind of talking about what's the most influential or the most significant. So for me, Texas Chainsaw Massacre was the first horror movie that I can remember watching. And I was in sixth grade. I was at Adam Nicholson's house for a <laughs> birthday party. And we were all sitting there watching this just completely just heinous <laughs> movie. Yeah. And it was sort of like my introduction to horror. And it was what hooked me. <laughs> my son and I have been watching horror movies like every weekend my 16 year old and I kind of have like a horror movie night and I was like kind of want to confirm that Texas Chainsaw Massacre is my favorite because I haven't watched it in many years maybe it was just sitting there watching it with my 16 year old kid <laughs> and I was kind of like I kind of find this movie annoying now like <laughs> it, it, it's I mean I just forget how annoying the one character the Franklin. Franklin is just, yeah. <laughs> it's just, I couldn't take Franklin. Like something about growing up made me not be, be able to take Franklin. <laughs> Right after that, we watched The Cabin in the Woods, and that was when it, it kind of hit me. I was like, interestingly, I didn't plan this, but there's so many, there's parallels between the two in a lot of crazy ways, but it is, I think it's gotta be my favorite for a lot of different reasons. Did you see it when it first came out in theaters back in 2012? Oh yeah. And did you know anything going into it when you first no, saw it? that's the thing, that, that was the key, is that I literally knew nothing. I just knew that Joss Whedon was involved. No one even told me like, oh, there's a, there's a twist or there's, it's an interesting take. I, I don't know how I would have interpreted it otherwise, but because of that, I just, I was in the perfect state of mind for it. Me too, man. I remember going to the theater with a big group of friends and all I had heard was that it was a good movie and that's it. Nothing about a twist or anything. And I just remember the number of times my mind was blown watching that movie was just unparalleled with any other movie watching experience. It was just like, how are they doing this? I'm not one of those guys that tries to figure out a movie as I'm watching it. I like to just get lost in it and just let it happen to me. So I remember it being well into like halfway through the movie when I really started to understand what was happening. But of course, this time watching it and realizing they actually start the whole movie with the engineers. I totally forgot about that. Yeah, that opening scene really sets the tone. Are you even listening to me? I mean, that's one of my favorite things about the movie is just how funny it is. You know, it's kind of like Scream where it's still a lot of horror elements. It's still scary. It's still pretty graphic. But I think even more so than Scream, it just focuses so much on being funny and is so successful with that. The ancient ones see everything and they will not be... <laughs> I'm still on speakerphone, aren't I? <laughs> the two uh, engineers. Oh, man, yeah, Richard Jenkins and Bradley Whitford. Without them, <laughs> I don't know. It would have been a completely different movie because there's just, like, humor on two different levels, right? With the kids, basically, you're laughing at sort of the archetypes and the critique of, like, a slasher film. And there's something in Latin. Okay. 
I'm drawing a line in the fucking sand here. Do not read the Latin. But with them, it's just like good writing. It's just, just good, funny dialogue between two really funny guys. So huge part of the reason I love it. So what should we call Japan? Tell them to take the rest of the weekend off. Yeah, right. They're Japanese. What are they going to do, relax? Yeah, I mean, Bradley Whitford's always been one of my favorite undersung comedic actors, and I didn't even watch The West Wing, which I think is his, his biggest role yeah, that yeah, he's yeah. most well-known for, but I'm just a lifelong Billy Madison fan, and he's, <laughs> you know, the bad guy in that. I ate some Trisket crackers in the car. You should have had some. Well, maybe if you told me they were delicious Trisket crackers, I could have enjoyed them with you. I'm sorry. Well, sorry doesn't put the Trisket crackers in my stomach, now does it, Carl? And his, he just has these little moments. Like, I was just re-watching Cabin. I'm always noticing things that I didn't before. Like, when Richard Jenkins makes fun of him for betting on the merman, and he's like, what, what's that supposed to mean? And then Richard Jenkins goes and talks to other people in the foreground. In the background, you see Bradley Whitford just do, like, the pissiest little, like, head turn away. A little motion like that was so funny to me. Well, and then the, the payoff of the merman is just... Yeah. <laughs> is, oh, come on. <laughs> uh, yeah, there's, there's a lot. There's a lot to love, man. Oh, come on. When you first saw this movie, it sounds like it immediately struck a chord with you. Yeah, you know, it's funny because, as you know, I'm a horror fan, but not necessarily a slasher genre fan. I'm more supernatural thriller. The idea of somebody being possessed or there being a ghost or a demon around is more personally scary to me than like a dude with a chainsaw. You know, it's, it just feels weirdly more unrealistic to me. I don't know why. So I think that it allowed me to articulate a bunch of problems that I had with the slasher genre that I would not have been able to actually articulate if you asked me, why don't you like it? But then if I was like, oh, actually it's because it feels like the characters are usually being manipulated into making really bad decisions for the sake of the plot. And there's these conventions that always end up happening and you're just like, why are the characters so stupid? But then the way that they translate that into, oh, they're actually being drugged. <laughs> That's why they're making bad decisions. And why does this couple think that it's a good idea to screw in the woods? Oh, because these pheromones got released, you know? It's like so many of those pieces coming together as a satire, as a critique on the slasher film was like, it was saying something that I wasn't able to articulate myself. I think that's why this is also one of my favorite horror movies, because like you said, it so perfectly lasers in on the problems with slashers and even kind of offers an explanation like, I know that those characters were real dumb, but maybe they were just being manipulated into doing that. They even have the idea at first, okay, we have to stick together if we want to win this thing, <laughs> and then they just pump them more full of drugs and they're like no we should we should split up we should definitely <laughs> split up this is right we should split up yeah good idea really it's funny because I think that the moment where they're about to have sex in the woods and you know that her top's about to come off and then it cuts to the engineers and all the dudes are just sitting there looking, just waiting, was like such a relatable moment. I think about being a teenager watching a horror movie and just even though no one's talking about it, all the dudes in the room are just waiting for this moment with that same sort of mouth agape look on their face. And the way that they were able to capture that with a bunch of adult men was just, it was a beautiful moment. Yeah. <laughs> It's, it's exactly that moment when you're watching a horror movie with your friends when you're younger and you're like, oh, it might happen and nobody says anything. You're right. They just capture it perfectly. Look. Here comes the obligatory tit shot. And even I love how Bradley Whitford in that moment kind of reverts to like a teenage boy. I think he's like, okay, baby, show us the boobies. Like he says the word <laughs> boobies. It's so funny. Okay, baby, let's see some boobies. And yeah, I think a lot's been said about how the engineers kind of function as audience surrogates. I mean, there's even a shot of Bradley Whitford eating popcorn. And yeah, I just think that adds to the brilliance of this movie. It works on so many different levels. Being able to understand these five archetypes that exist. Like we watched them back to back we did a double feature of texas chainsaw massacre and then cabin in the woods and same setup is five people three guys two girls obviously franklin is the fool yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you don't really have the virgin but you have who kind of represents the girl that's good you know is going to make it to the end and it just made me start thinking like oh was texas chainsaw massacre one of the first times that it was done in this formulaic way because i don't know enough about horror history but i know that texas chainsaw massacre was so groundbreaking for its time but then you really notice it when you watch it back just how cheaply made it was which is one of the things that makes it such an incredible accomplishment but it just set the tone for so many things and it made me think oh i kind of want to do like a 
study of how many movies have followed this exact formula since that time. And I love that Cabin in the Woods has someone who we all know and respect and is kind of a legend of the genre, Sigourney Weaver, coming out and being that authoritative figure and explaining it all to everyone. Oh, yeah. I mean, first of all, I heard that they wrote the screenplay in three days, which seems absolutely ridiculous that that's possible. But it's one of those things that you could just imagine Joss Whedon and Drew Goddard like breaking the story and they're like, oh, 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 oh. And the director is Sigourney Weaver. And you're like, well, yeah, of course, if we can get her. It's, it's one of those things where you know that they got their first choice. And the second we said, okay, well, who is the top of our list? And there's the list is one and it's Sigourney Weaver. In that moment, you're like, oh man, they were actually able to pull this off. I don't know how, but they did. We work with what we have. And interestingly, I also wasn't, I, I mean, I've always respected Joss Whedon, but I, like, I, I'm not a Buffy fan. That wasn't really, I, I kind of missed that wave. I wasn't a huge Buffy fan. It's just strange that it connect, I connected with it so much. And since, you know, that was Goddard's like directorial debut, I, I've enjoyed a lot of stuff that he's done since then. I wasn't anticipating it. And I think it's one of those moments where it was people were like, oh, we should go see this. People are saying that it's good. That was all, that was it. That was all I knew. So I was in the right headspace. I think that's sometimes the best way to see a movie is just, oh, that's good. Okay, don't tell me anymore. I'm gonna yeah, go see it. Yeah. Exactly. All right, so obviously the movie is pretty great start to finish from that opening hilarious scene where they're just nonchalantly talking about the kid's safety mechanisms on Bradley Whitford's cupboards at home. She did the upper cabinets. Kid will be 30 before he can reach, I'm assuming, you know, we have a kid. To the last shot of the Elder Gods reaching up through the earth and ending the world. But what are some of your favorite moments in the movie that really stand out to you? One of my favorite things about the whole film is the fact that they, in the process of sort of skewering the idea of the slasher film, they also did what no slasher film would ever do. And that is your protagonist just kind of give up at the end <laughs> and smoke a joint. <laughs> yeah. You know, the fact that they're sitting there and they make a decision to get high when all they have to really do is make a super easy, a simple decision to save all of humanity, they don't do it. So it's almost like the giant hand of the ancient one coming up is just kind of giving you the middle finger. <laughs> <laughs> It might as well be, yeah. Yeah, it might as well. It, it would have betrayed everything that they were trying to say if they hadn't ended it like that. The genius of that really didn't hit me until watching it again. I remember leaving that theater that first time and being like, I can't believe that they actually did that. And I think now, you know, we're eight years out from it. We're used to media that is really self-reflective and meta and comments on itself and the tropes around it. Everything's kind of self-referential and interconnected. But I don't think that was quite as much the case back then. When I saw this for the first time, I was just astounded by how self-aware it was. Yeah, it's a, that's a good point though, that it's become more common. This is also the kind of thing that you can bring anybody to. So like, oh, I, you're, I'm not a horror fan. Oh, it doesn't matter. Are you a comedy fan? Are you a satire fan? Because you, you would enjoy this. What are you doing with these? Okay, I get it. I'll leave the no, 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 who gave you these? Who taught you about these? I learned it from you, okay? I learned it from watching you! But it was also, there's parts that are actually legitimately scary, especially the first time I watched it. I was like, oh, this is, I'm totally being shown, the, the curtain is being pulled back for how I am being manipulated as an audience member, but yet I'm still finding this scary. It's just kind of crazy they were able to pull that off. Yeah, I actually think that the Buckner family is kind of like an undersung part of the movie because I think, especially when you get to the end and you see all the, the zany creative monsters that they have in store, some people who watch this movie are like, well, why couldn't we have gotten the unicorns or the merman running around for the whole movie? But I think the reason the movie works is because it takes such a standard, a zombie redneck torture family, and it puts them as the main antagonist. We have a winner. It's the Buckners, ladies and gentlemen. They may be zombified, pain-worshipping, backwoods idiots. But there are zombified, pain-worshipping, backwoods idiots. But it does them so well. Like, Matthew Buckner, the big, like, real wet, slipknot-looking guy, he is a scary mofo, man. He, yeah, definitely. And I love the fact that even before, you know, the elevator system sort of reveals all the different options, you kind of know what they are because of the, the betting board. It helped me recognize the interchangeable nature of the antagonist in a horror film. It's like, this is sort of a paint-by-numbers thing, and you could have just put anything in there, and it's super smart that they chose something that's been done a lot. But then you still got to enjoy when the mayhem kind of breaks out at the end you got to see a unicorn kill somebody yeah. <laughs> you know <laughs> 
they had to make all these monsters and they had like a team of 60 people, I think, that were working on costumes at the time because they basically had to create an army of monsters. And I think that's probably one of the reasons that people were initially hesitant because it's just like, yeah, yeah, it's, it's really about these zombies, but we have to make like every single monster that you could imagine possibly being in a horror movie. Okay. <laughs> yeah, and it's just for like the last 20 minutes that they really all get shown, but man, right. I don't think anyone who watches this movie is going to forget those last 20 minutes. Oh, no. There's always something that you can find wrong with a movie, and it seems like the most common specific criticism I see of this movie is a single shot. It's the shot of the bird flying into the force field when they first go through that mountain pass, and I've seen so many people comment, oh, why'd they have that? It would have been more entertaining for Chris Hemsworth to ride his motorcycle into that without us knowing that. And for me, I've never really questioned it. You know, they're dropping throughout the movie the guy on the roof and cutting back to Bradley Whitford and Richard Jenkins, just these little, like, breadcrumbs starting to lead you to what's actually going on and to me that's always been a part of it so it never bothered me but if you had creative control would you take that shot out you know like i was saying earlier when i watch i don't tend to be the kind of person that's thinking about things on that level and it, even though i create things for a living i still a lot of times don't get super critical because i just like to be an audience member so at the time no not a problem at all now that you mention it i <laughs> do realize that the moment when chris hemsworth character runs into it with a motorcycle would have been more surprising without the bird for sure even though it's still surprising because you kind of forget that that's what happened or if you're like me you've kind of forgotten that by the time you get to that point and you're like oh yeah there's a wall okay i remember that now i actually think that speaks to how good the movie is that the most common criticism i hear of it is so specific and narrow and it's just like that's just one shot you know like it, it's nothing on a bigger level it's nothing about the writing or the acting it's just like yeah man that was a great movie i, I would have gotten rid of that one shot there is one thing thing, but I'm actually going to turn it into a question for you at oh. the end when we go through, when I try to stump you. Okay. Is a problem that people have pointed out that when I thought about it, I was like, oh yeah, but we'll see. We'll see if you can figure it out. I'll give you some hints. I'm so curious. All right. So I've asked you to come up with a couple of trivia questions to try to stump me about your favorite horror movie. And I just got to let you know, you have a little bit of a disadvantage here because I did cover this on a kill count and it's, I think my second longest kill count because I went so hard in the research because there was so oh. much to look at for this movie. So I'm, I'm curious to see how deep these questions go. Okay, all right. I'm up for the challenge. Okay, here we go. All right. Do you think that the coffee mug telescoping bong featured in the movie that Marty's character uses so aggressively is a real product? Like, could I go online and purchase it? Yes. I have not looked at it to purchase. <laughs> but my editor, Zorin, when I was making the kill count for this movie, messaged me and said, hey, I have the telescopic bong if you want to put it in the background of the video. <laughs> so oh, because gosh. it has been in my apartment, I'm going to have to say, yes, you can get that product. Yes, you can get it at, not a sponsor, coffeemugpipe.com. And uh, it is sold out. They also have a Rasta version. What does that entail? Just colors? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, fully functional, I imagine. It says so, but of course, it says very clearly on the website that it is a tobacco pipe. Tobacco products only. So yeah. keep that in mind. I wonder how much longer companies will have to keep up that ruse, you know? <laughs> a giant bomb in your father's van? What are you, stone? So, okay, so I walked into that one. I, well, if you've done that level of research, then you're gonna know this one. So what video game had a tie-in with the movie? Oh, Left 4 Dead. Yes. Which I actually didn't mention in my coverage of the movie because I don't really play that game. And so I didn't include it in my script, but boy, did the comments let me know that <laughs> what, the, the, the boomer and the, the witch character, I guess, they were included in, in the little boxes? Yeah, so it was originally planned to be a more specific tie-in and there was gonna be basically downloadable content in the game based on some of the different settings in the movie. Oh. But they, they scrapped that basically because of MGM's financial problems with the movie getting delayed and so they couldn't time it out. So what they ended up doing is they ended up inserting those characters at the very end. So those Left 4 Dead characters, which I wasn't familiar with the franchise, so I didn't even know 
that's where they came from. That's interesting because I know that a lot of people would be interested in playing a video game version of Cabin in the Woods where you get a randomly assigned monster. Although it's kind of like, have you ever played the board game Betrayal at House on the Hill? I uh, know. It's a board game where it almost functions as the same kind of thing with Cabin in the Woods because you're, you're going through and you're kind of building this mansion and then a haunt will happen at some point and there are like 50 different monsters that depending on the circumstances, you look up in a book and then it's like each of them have different uh, win criteria. All right, so you're two for two. Okay. Now this goes back to what I hinted at before. What is legitimately the biggest plot hole in the entire movie? Oh no. Oh man, a plot a plot hole. And I'll, I'll give you your first hint. It has to do with Marty's character. Plot hole with Marty, the stoner, whose weed immunized him from the effects of their, their drugs. Think I'm a puppet, gonna do a little... A fucking puppet dance! It's not that, because that's great, yeah. Yeah, no, that's awesome. Um, <laughs> oh, man, you know, I was so excited to finally have a perfect score on one of these trivia runs, but I'm going to have to give up. I don't know the answer. Okay, so, of course, when Judah Buckner kills Marty, it, you know, in the first third, mm -hmm. there's an earlier shot in the movie where the engineers are monitoring everyone's vital signs. So if Marty lived through that initial attack, oh, man. the engineers would have known that he, it wouldn't have been a surprise. That's but right. the fact that it was a surprise only when he comes out of nowhere at the end kind of betrays the idea that the engineers, at least somebody watching those vital signs would have known. Yeah. And that's never addressed. That totally makes sense because they have all that information on the screens in front of them. And, you know, you would think that when they, they pulled that lever and it shook, which I imagine isn't what it's supposed to do, they just write it off as, I think they're like, oh, they're getting a little right down there. It, it doesn't make sense that they didn't find out until they got a call from, I believe, the director telling them that. Yeah, the director let them know something that they already revealed that they would know, which is a little strange, isn't it? Yeah. In an otherwise perfect movie. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think, once again, that speaks to just the quality of the movie that you don't really think about that. And yeah. honestly, I don't really care. You know, having been informed, I'm like, fuck it. You know what? I don't care. Yeah, it doesn't yeah. matter to me. <laughs> you know, I did all right. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I, I'd say I thought I was going to get you on a two out of three, but you got two out of three. So well done. One day I'll get a perfect score, though. Fingers crossed, man. <laughs> Thanks so much for joining me for this, Rhett. It was a pleasure to talk to you, man. Yeah, it's always good to uh, connect with somebody other than your immediate family that you're sharing a home with during these weird times. <laughs> yeah, you start to forget about other people and wonder if they're even real. Right, exactly. <laughs> Thanks again for joining us a while back on the podcast. You and Link, that was a great conversation. Yeah, man. I encourage anyone who didn't already see see it to check that out now and uh yeah i hope that you and yours are all weathering this okay you know as best as you can yeah you too man it was we're all kind of living through our own version of a, a post-apocalyptic movie so yeah we're all doing our best well thanks a lot man i appreciate it yeah thanks for having me and thanks everyone for watching i think we have more episodes coming up i forget because i'm filming these out of order and i don't know what order i'll release them in so maybe there's more ahead stay tuned be good people <laughs>